Confront the authorities. We're back with our series on being an elder. We just uh, we just watched the uh, movie scene of from Scent of a Woman, the the end part where Al Pacino goes in and uh, it's a, it's the, it's the climactic scene. Basically, the the two dramas playing out in the movie is the young boy who before this scene happens, I don't think he knows Al Pacino's character. He's just gonna go, he's doing a job to go and take care of this old blind man. And uh, he's in trouble at school and he has pressure from his peers and from the authorities at school to, uh, to rat on, well, his peers don't want him to rat them out. They did something that he's being accused of and the authorities are threatening to expel him and uh, not get him into university um, unless he does rat them out. This is the conflict that he's facing. And, it, and uh, the old man's conflict, the, uh, the veteran's conflict, Al Pacino's character, well, he's, he starts the movie. He's gonna have one last shebang in life. He's gonna drive a, a fast car. He's gonna sleep with a beautiful woman. He's gonna, uh, it's been a long time since I saw the movie, but he's gonna kind of just check a couple things off his bucket list and then he's gonna kill himself, he's gonna shoot himself. And uh, Charlie, the young guy, saves his life, basically, and uh, gives him a reason to live. And, and this climactic scene, Al Pacino's character comes into the school with him to stand with him as he faces the the trial uh, of the boy, Charlie, and uh, faces the judgment of his peers and his authorities. And uh, I mean, talk about being an elder and just having, you know, this, this old military veteran who's seen battle, who's seen many things, mm -hmm. to sit with you, beside you, have to have your back during that that occasion and then to make that stand for you at the end you know and it's it's also a stand for in making that stand the uh, Al Pacino's character reclaims his honor but that's what that's what I what I think is incredible it really is uh, Charlie giving him or it's also Charlie giving him a reason to live and the reason is being an elder yes you know yes so yeah, and and uh, he also stands up for Charlie. Mm. Hans and I've been talking about this recently. Standing with and standing for. Um, it's a, there's a distinction there that's really powerful. Maybe we can talk about that in today's episode or a future one. But but he also uh, so he stands up and gives a speech, confronts the authorities, confronts Charlie's peers and confronts the entire institution. Like, what's the culture they're building here? It's a, it's a prep school. It's an elite prep school in America. And they take pride in raising up men, boys to men, preparing them for leadership in the world with a long storied tradition of, you know, great men coming from that institution. But they're basically, uh, it's become a culture of compromise. Yes, and... and how does he say it? Training, making a vessel of snitches. Rats, <laughs> yeah. Vessel of, of rats, a yes. ship of rats. Rewarding the one that snitches and uh, punishing, punishing the, the one that, that doesn't want to. The ones that have character. There's some great lines in that speech. Great lines in that speech. But, uh, yeah, so that role, you know, that role Al Pacino plays there for Charlie, it's a great role for an elder. And as we were getting ready to go live, I was thinking of some examples for myself. Um, probably the most examples I have for my personal life are my mother going in and confronting school authorities, um, also church authorities, my mom was, my mom was a warrior, you know. 
She was down to confront anyone that was messing with her kids. Yeah. Yeah, she really was. Mother Bear, you know? Fucking great role for an elder. And I, it's great to... It's great to have the, the younger ones see that example. You know? You don't just take... You don't take it lying down. Whatever yeah. the, the dictates come from above. I'm thinking of... Uh, even in like... I'm thinking of... I'm looking at, say, coaches but like in sports, you know? And I'm looking at some of the greatest coaches, both in cycling and football, and, and one of their characteristics is that they always defend their players. Like, you see a, a Jose Mourinho, or you see a, the guy in the, in the cycling, I forget now, the Belgian guy, but they would always defend their riders. Like they will, you have some coaches and they would like publicly not humiliate, but like blame or, or, you know, or not standing with or for them. But it's a great sign of great coaches that they're also elders and they protect their players, their team, no matter what. Doesn't care if, if they fuck it up for the team and he's angry with them, you know, to the outside world, he's to the press and to the other teams or, or the public image, he's always defending his players, you know, and it creates such a strong team mentality that you have this guy in charge the elder like taking care of them no matter what I don't care if it's right or wrong I'm defending you you know mm. and uh, I think that's beautiful it's very that it's an incredible connective power community power you know and if you're working in a team I, I imagine that's what leads to the result if you got if you know your elder is going to defend you no matter what Fuck, yeah. man, you, you go to battle for him, you go, yeah. you know? So... Another of uh, the best examples I can think of, a man named Michael Richards. He, uh, I've told you this anecdote a couple times, but, you know, uh, Florentine was at this uh, conference looking for visionaries and leaders to come and attend our ice dance, one of our ice dance in 2007. And she had these... Uh, full-page flyers that she was passing out and uh, this flyer the headline is uh, you know calling for 44 visionaries willing to face everything avoid nothing and stand for humanity <laughs> she has it to this guy he takes one look at it reads the headline he said I'll be there <laughs> you know and that was it they didn't talk anymore and he showed up and uh, this was a guy who literally, we talk about being an elder as, as someone who um, goes beyond your own personal children mm. to take in and raise up, defend, stand for, stand with more people than his own uh, immediate family. And the woman that he, he had been dating for several years they broke up. She ended up, um, I think, becoming a drug addict. And she had, she had two kids with this other guy. Um, and she died. And in the meantime, he'd gone and had two children, two sons, with another woman um, on the other side of the country. And when he heard that she died, and there were these two boys left behind with no at least no mother, possibly no father either. I think no father. He went and adopted them, he took them in as his own. Um, and this was the kind of man he was like in, uh, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, he started a yeah, really visionary duty. He, he invented a kind of like soy based wax um, to counter, you know, the petroleum wax and he hired homeless people off the street so they it took them into his house actually not just gave them a job took them into his house so that, you know it gets very fucking cold in Iowa you know like you don't know cold until you spend a winter in Iowa and he gave them a place to live a place to work he gave them uh, a way to reclaim their 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 dignity and, uh, but this was the guy who was, and he would, 
he would go, he was the kind of guy so active in his local community, he would go in by himself and confront the city council, confront the people with all the money, like, like any issue on behalf of the community, on behalf of the people. He was, he was the warrior, he was the fighter, he was there. And uh, I later become, became friends with one of his sons, and we spent some time in, uh, in Thailand. And I would hear his judgments of his father, you know. He judged his father for basically caring for too many other people, mm. in a way it seemed like, and not being there enough for, for him. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, and Hans, you and I haven't had children, obviously. Otherwise, I imagine we would have much more call to confront the authorities. The people who are trying to well, raise our children, educate them, punish them, yes. you know, that's a real conflict. Yes. You have people with different values. You have people you see could be somehow uh, having your child uh, bow down to false authority, what you see as false authority. But I do see some redemption now, because I was thinking too, I, I, I don't have any clear instances, but I see some redemption possible. What's the, that friend of yours whose son was judging him, you know, do you see him that he was playing or was being the elder for all these other people and that it may have come at the cost of caring for his own son? Yeah, actually, I don't know how much... Yeah, I think that was part of it. Another part of it, another reason he judged his dad, which which was a way that I honored his... I was like, wow, what an incredible father, mm. was that this guy, the, his son, um, bright kid, visionary kid, had ideas for, like, world peace. This was back in the Cold War. So his dad encouraged him to take off to the Soviet Union. So this kid, I, I don't know, he's maybe 12, 13, 14, and he's standing for world peace, and his dad's totally in support of him, going off and doing this kind of thing. Earlier in his life, his dad had taken him and his brother before they'd adopted the other two on, on a year-long trip by car, uh, by truck down through Mexico into Central America into into South America all around like just making up their own journey like as a way of educating them as a way of raising them up and uh, and eventually this kid he had ideas for a movie you know full support of his dad and the kid uh writes a screenplay, you know, and a traveling troupe of actors comes to town, you know, theater, whatever. He wants to join this group of, he wants to join this theater group. His dad encourages him. So as a young teenage boy, the, he, ta he joins this theater company, takes off. He ends up selling his screenplay to a major uh, Hollywood studio for... I, was, I think it was like $100,000. This was back in the 80s. You know, so in today's money, maybe that's, I don't know, a quarter million dollars or something. And uh, I'm like, wow, what a, what a great elder, you know, to encourage, to encourage his son to just go off and fully believe in himself and take on the world and make things happen. But... Yeah, he had, he had judgments about his father for some of that in the long run. Would have liked his father to have done it differently. So, but probably all, just about all fathers face that judgment of their children, no matter how they do it. At you least know. at some point. Part of the cost, part of the risk of taking on that role of, of elder is that, uh, you know, one day you'll likely be accused of all that's wrong in their life. Yes. If only you had raised them differently. 
Yeah, it's an it's an incredible it's an incredible role of honor to be a father, to be to be an elder. Mm. Yeah. Yes, go watch that scene. It's very powerful. And what a gift it must be to uh, have someone like that in your life. What a gift it must be that you could, you know, be that person for someone. Like, Charlie saved his life you know, by uh, yeah, letting him be or calling him forth to be an elder for him. You know? I remember when I... When I encouraged my youngest brother to leave school and leave his mom's house at 16, 17, come live with me in Texas, and I'd, I'd teach him, you know, to, what he needs to be a man. And uh, and then my brother Dave got him from university to come out, and uh, I didn't actually have to confront their authorities. I felt very kind of in a, in a rebellious revolutionary way ready to like I was very much a stand I was making for them but yeah I don't think I have to you know I do remember this one moment several years later after I'd been with my you know my brothers we were it was a Saturday night and we this was at a point in time when we we now or they had landscaping businesses now because I split my landscaping business in three. And uh, there was there was a night we were on the, on my Saturday night on my porch, Austin, we're celebrating, and uh, a cop, an undercover cop, walks up through the front gate, and he's confronting us about IDs and you know. And especially back then, I had so many confrontations with uh, authorities or police in particular. And uh, oh, he right. he grabbed me in front of my brothers and a couple of girls we were seeing who were there, threw me to my knees, humiliated me in front of my brothers. And uh, I don't know. I'm trying to I'm trying to remember these moments. You know, I don't, I don't have like. The I don't think I have but an there is one. Chino. Yes, there is. The, the the farmer guy, the big guy who confronted your mom. And when he's yelling at your mom, get off my porch. Oh, right. Well, that was him doing that, not, yes. not me doing that. But he's, he, no, but he was defending you in that moment. He was the Al Pacino character yes, for me. Yes, he was Al Pacino right. for you. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. That was a powerful moment for me. <laughs> exactly. So growing, growing up, my mom. You're was, Charlie in that moment. My mom was such a dominant uh, figure. No one messed with my mom. <laughs> and, but uh, so she was very much a powerful, positive role model in ways. But then to also see someone confront her, a man, was powerful for me. Uh, Tell the story, man. All right. So, well, I have to shortcut the story. I'll enter the story at a point where I'm 17, senior year of high school is about to start. I've been mostly riding the bus to school the first three years of high school. I've worked all, I've worn my ass off all summer as a masonry laborer, which is about the hardest job you can have in the heat of summer. And, uh, on can you know, I'm par with being a roofer. And I've earned the money to pay for a car. It's a long story, but I've basically stolen a car back from someone who stole it from my mother. And she said I could have it if I, I was willing to get the car back. So now I have the car, senior year's about to start. She's telling me don't drive it because it's not yet registered. And if because I'm only seventeen, if I get in trouble with the car she'll be in trouble as the one who's responsible for me, as the elder, right? I'm disobeying her and I'm taking, I'm driving the car during the day when she's not there to get it fixed up, get it ready for, 
for the school year to start. And I come home one evening, I've been driving the car, I walk into the house, I come into the kitchen, my siblings are there, and uh, she confronts me and she says, give me the keys, it's my car, I'm taking it back. And so I have this choice to make, you know, <laughs> this decision to make. On the one hand, the keys, this is my passport to freedom, to girlfriends, to coolness, my senior year, everything is here. My manhood, my balls, you know, is, is in this hand. And then the other is, like, if I give it to my mom, I lose everything, you know. And again, I wonder what you did. <laughs> to me, this is, this is everything. My whole life is right here on this choice. And my mom is, like I said, some people may have, I don't know, some people have different kind of mothers, but my mother you don't mess with. And uh, I said, did I say no? I said no in some form, whether I shook my head or whatever. And I started walking away from her. She started walking after me. Give me the keys. You know? <laughs> Sorry, mom, if you're watching this, you know. Stand off. <laughs> this, this was, uh, the rest of this story is kind of a, tra a traumatic moment for my mom that, that to this day I don't think she's forgiven me for. But uh, then she starts chasing after me, this, this big kitchen and dining room area. And a couple, we take a couple of passes around this this long island. All my brothers and sisters are there. She's like, Dave, stop him. Lisa, stop him. They kind of give a half-ass effort, but don't dare get in between either one of us. <laughs> and uh, I'm happy you're telling the short version. <laughs> How many laps? <laughs> I, I head for the front door, and she says, uh, yeah, she's, she's, I mean, she, we're, and now we're running, you know. She says, if you go out that door, don't you ever come back? She either, she, she denies this, but maybe she doesn't remember it, but I remember very clearly. And I went out that front door so fast. I didn't even have to think twice at that point. And she, she slammed that door so hard. It's a door that, it's a, it's a double door, heavy door. It's not supposed to swing outside the house, only it swings inside. It went through the hinges, slams up against the outside of the house, and then back close. I took off in the car to my, my friend's house. I'm telling him what happens. We see lights out front. We look out. It's my mom and her friend. And they're out there trying to take the license plates off the car. And I'm like, oh shit, what are we going to do? So we go to tell my friend's dad, who's this big, like 350 pound monster of a man. You know, and he's sitting in this big recliner reading the newspaper with his glasses, you know, just like out of a cartoon or something, you know. <laughs> And uh, we tell him what's going on. He gets up, you know, <laughs> it's just like huge. And he's like, deep voice, big barrel chested, has to go sideways through the door, you know, walks out there, still newspaper in hand. He's like, hey, get off my property, you know. And I've never seen my mom move so fast. <laughs> <laughs> her and her friend took off to the car, didn't say anything, and just hightailed it out of there. And I had never, you know, I had had moments of confronting my mother before this that were powerful for me. And again, I'm, you know, it's hard for my mom to hear these stories because she hears it as betrayal by me. But uh, for me, I'm, you know, I'm proud that I stood up to her. As you know, as, as at 16, at 17, and um, maybe a, maybe the role of a father, or maybe the role of an elder, is also to protect a boy from his mom's love. Yes, yeah. Well, I don't know. This was not my mom being overly motherling, mothering, but it's a way of describing how it's a, mothers love their children. It's, uh, yeah. Well, my mom was not over, like, not smothering mothering. She really, like, let us run free and take risks. And um, my mom, in a lot of ways, played the role of the father. So well, what I'm saying is, whatever that is, whatever that is, there needs to be a, a counterpoint to it. 
And that counterpoint is that of the father or the elder or the... Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, to, just to, as a point of reference, because if that's the only thing. So, whatever that love of the mom is, there needs to be a counterpoint, and that could be the role of... Mm -hmm. That's the role of the father or the elder. Yeah, once my dad left home at, at, when I was 14, it was only her reign, you know, it was her kingdom. Yeah, I don't need to tell all the family stories on a public podcast, but <laughs> it was... Uh, to talk to your mom again, okay? Yeah. She might be watching. My mom knows I love her. Uh, I'll, I'll finish it off with this. My dad then took me in, because I, I lived at my friend's house for, I don't know, maybe a week. My dad took me in, he was living with his new wife. It, it sucked to be there. My dad found a home for me with my uncle out in the Wild West in, in Utah. And, uh, you know, yeah, there's a role of an elder that my dad played there for sure. Um, took me in, right? Took me in. This is one of the things we had listed on, on being an elder. Yes. And, but I had to go back one more time to get my things to go and move out west or to go live with my dad and I'll never forget walking up the the walkway to the front door and my mom's there doing dishes in the window of the kitchen kitchen and the and the look of in the look in her eyes like she yeah like she'd been betrayed by me you know it was uh yeah a difficult moment um and yet very, very much something that the young man needs to do. Yes. He needs to have that separation from his mother at some point. He needs to walk away. Maybe to become a man, you need to disappoint your mom. You need to kill off. Very, very much so. To be a man who can then confront the women and lead the women in your life. Yes. Who can confront, you know, the dis who can walk his own path, be his own man mm -hmm. in the face of disappointing and the disapproval of his mother and his father as well. But, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's something that, uh, unfortunately it seems so many young men are not doing these days. Actually, that would be a, a whole new episode, you know, how to become a man, disappoint your mom It's for another Maybe. day. Do a, do a series on becoming a man. Yes. That'd be awesome. Great uh, whole new series to explore. I see Steve Smith, if you're still watching. What's up, brother? It was great uh, talking to you. I was in, um, where was I, Steve, when we had that call? Uh, oh, it was last year in, in Ecuador. I'd actually gone back to, I'd spent four months with my mom. Um, Helping her out, watching over her, taking care of her, and I was I was stranded. the The authorities would not let me out of Ecuador. The whole COVID pandemic and everything. And my brother Steve had been going through a very difficult time with his split with his wife. Mm. But I see you, brother, and. Uh, the eye stands are coming back. Steve attended my eye stands back in the day, 2006. Yeah, so other men watching where we are standing for, hosting, putting on some events for men to come and reclaim, re-embrace their sacred honor. Standing with also. And uh, yeah, come, come to reclaim your honor, your brothers, your allies. This is for all men who may be watching gonna do some holy work there end of October in Medellin Colombia if you've, if you've been compromising in your life which happens it happens come back and uh, yeah yeah you want to make a comeback you want to say stop no more and live the rest of your life with purpose and vision and and, and brothers find your vision again it's a vision quest it's an honor quest it's an ally quest 
We're gonna do it in the Andes Mountains at a place that looks like uh, the last samurai, where where the the last of the samurai lived in the movie The Last Samurai. So see you here tomorrow.